Okay, so let me explain it. At my workplace, we have over 200 uh, scientific workstations, like the Dell Precisions with ECC memory. And, uh, and we also have a, like a, currently two, we're going to get some more, like basically we call them public service, like VNC, x to go remote desktop for people who don't have their own scientific workstation. Because these are scientific workstations, they run basically roughly around like 100, or more than 100 unique applications and often need to access multiple versions of the same application. Uh, they're not like a server where, you know, a server is a single role, like it says only a web server, this is only a database server, et cetera. People use them for everything from Chrome and Firefox web browsing to Lib and LibreOffice to uh, like MATLAB and uh, like their favorite text editors. We support so many different text editors. Um, and as a result, one of the fundamental problems is that each of these, let's just call them CentOS slash RHEL workstations, have, uh, you know, upwards of about 4,000 packages. Now, software collections, like binary RPMs installed. By the time they finish being provisioned, um, since software collections has increased that number, you know, before that was closer to like 3,000, like 3,500, uh, but still. So, um, so we, we, over the time, we discovered a number of tricks we could do to speed up the provision. Um, although not so much about tricks, but actually those like, you know, the future way of doing things. I'll start off with, uh, you know, the CentOS uh, YUM4 announcement. Uh, Oh, and allow me to clarify. So these workstations start out being provisioned by uh, using Red Hat Satellite. Satellite basically snapshots the YUM repos. There's lots of other ways of snapshotting YUM repos out there, but uh, Satellite is a really well integrated way. And it's based on Foreman and Catalos, the upstream open source projects. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Satellite also does, you know, kickstart Pixie booting installations. It, it powerfully templates those kickstart files for you. But in general, we only want about 5% of this, you know, we want as little of the system state as possible to find via this, the kickstart file. Uh, we want only like, you know, like 300 packages or so, just enough for command line, enough for SSH for them to be managed. Um, and enough to access the YUM repos, of course. Um, after that, the entire rest of the configuration, roughly like 95% of the entire workstation configuration is defined via Ansible code. These range from, you know, you know, NFS, uh, configure these NFS mounts, uh, including home directories, um, and, you know, configure log rotation to, uh, but a large portion of the Ansible runtime is uh, installing RPM packages, which, uh, and the traditional way of on Cent7 and RHEL7 to install RPM packages is to use the Ansible YUM module. So, Oops, sorry, excuse me. I'm using somebody else's laptop here. Uh, long story short, because I don't have a micro HDMI cable or adapter. Ansible. Um, I don't know how I got that open here. So the, the essential problem is that with roughly 4,000 packages to install using Ansible and YUM, the entire prison time was taking, I think, before we did any optimization whatsoever, and with the current package count, because we added more patches over time, would be something like like five hours, like like six. Uh, the fundamental, uh, if you were to just call yum on the command line, it would take less time. Um, so, I'm trying to sc scroll down. Oh, so Ansible has a you know, this yum module here, but the thing about the Ansible yum module is it doesn't. Ansible does not integrate with Yum very well. It, uh, if I say install, uh, you know, and first of all, to speed up versions, you do want to install packages via package groups. Um, there's a limited number of package groups you can use, though. So we do need to install about 2,000 RPMs in bulk. Um, so, uh, but the way Ansible integrates with Yum is that basically it. Uh, at the end, it calls YUM to actually do, do the installs, and YUM takes longer to evaluate how to install those packages you say you want installed than DNF does. But the bigger pr problem is that before Ansible calls YUM, it uses libRPM to, to query the RPM database to see if those packages are installed. And I tried changing the way we specify the packages in Ansible. I said, okay, instead of installing, um, what's the example? 
emacs.x86.64 to try and specify just emacs and vice versa, but it still takes just as long to query all those packages uh, regardless how you sp really specify the architecture or not. And we don't, therefore, we don't want to specify the version string because that changes constantly and that's defined via this, uh, the YUM repos. So um, as a result, you know, you could say Ansible YUM install 2,000 packages and about like 10 or 20% of that time would be spent installing them, uh, maybe closer to 50% before uh, no sync, but, and then the rest of the time is spent just querying the RPM database to see if they're already installed or not. Um, so uh, CentOS, you know, has the uh, uh, configuration, the configuration management uh, SIG for, uh, for CentOS, they're now providing a, a YUM repo that does, it, like it provides a newer version, uh, like I think a patch slash version of RPM with the features needed by DNF. And it provides DNF and it provides a compatibility uh, sim link or wrapper called YUM4. And from An uh, Ansible's perspective, when you have the YUM4 uh, repo added to your systems, RHEL 7 or CentOS 7, and you, uh, and when you, uh, oops, and when you, uh, you, you would, instead of, uh, once you have that installed, uh, you can now call the Ansible DNF module instead. Similarly, if you just use the Ansible package uh, task, the package task will automatically evaluate the DNF instead of YUM, but calling DNF or YUM explicitly gives you more features. Um, so, uh, so when you specify, when you specify to install those 2,000 binary RPMs with, with Ansible's DNF module, it basically just immediately installs them. It, it doesn't have to do those, you know, hours long checks of the RPM database, and it doesn't have to, uh, and it doesn't, uh, and it, or yum it's, it doesn't have YUM itself do its own checks before it call, uh, installs them. It just does very brief check and then install them all with DNF. At that point, it's basically as fast as RPM can go. Um, so uh, the other trick we used was uh, no sync. Um, Am I getting this correct result? I guess this is it. I thought I was, I, know, uh, I met the maintainer of this, uh, Mikolaz's Debski, and I thought he had a different username or something, but. Um, so no sync is a simple, uh, you know, .so file that you do, you insert via LD preload, and it squashes the sync and fsync uh, functions. This, um, it's totally unsafe to use this when your application is actually running, but if you're in the middle of a prison, but if you, at the end of the provision reboot anyway, so the reboot gracefully syncs the disks. Um, um, and, and, it, and on top of that, um, you know, this is a provision. If the provision fails, you just restart it. If it were to hypothetically kernel panic in the middle of it, you have to assume, oh, okay, it never, it failed in the middle of, of, of writing the disk, therefore I'm just gonna re restart the provision. Um, the way you would do that is uh, in an Ansible task, Ansible uh, environment. Sorry, I'm not used to this uh, laptop keyboard. You know, assuming you use like site.yaml that calls multiple roles, um, you would have environment and then, you know, LD underscore preload in all caps and then the path to your, uh, your you know, uh, user, uh, your uh, slash user slash lib64 slash no sync.so file. Um, Ultimately, RPM is the 64-bit binary, so even if you're installing 32-bit packages or whatever, it's still, I mean, I suppose 32-bit RPM scriptlets could, command just link could possibly go slow, but you, you can build no sync for 32-bit if you really want to. Um, I use that for mock sometimes, but, um, so the grand total of all these, uh, of these two, uh, of these two optimizations using DNF and then using uh, no sync, uh, means that the, the, that entire package installation phase is now about 30 minutes, uh, vast package installation phase is now about like 25 minutes. And the entire provision, including using, you know, YUM to install package groups and configure all these different config settings around the system, means that it now takes about an hour. 
which means, I mean, this is very big benefits. These are people systems, you know. It means that if somebody's system needs to be formatted, they're only down, we tell them we need a maintenance window of like two hours, but really it's, it really need about an hour to reformat their systems. If somebody uh, wants a new system, we can quickly, you know, spin it up and not have to worry about, you know, two business days to provide a new system workstation for a user. Um, and, uh, you know, especially when you're migrating people from L6 to L7 by reforming their system, you don't want to tell them, oh, we need, I think, the original, I think the, you know, originally it's like four hours, I think it would be more like five or six down number of packages. You don't want to tell them, oh, your workstation will be down for a total of seven hours. We just want to tell them your workstation will be down for upwards of two hours. Um, I, would, I would like to thank the, uh, uh, the configuration management uh, SIG very much for providing, uh, you know, uh, YUM4. Any questions? Sure. How are you uh, kicking off the Ansible? Are you doing it directly in Kickstart post, or are you doing it after the Kickstart install is run? So, um, originally we were using Foreman, uh, with, which had some partial upstream Foreman, has some partial Ansible integration, but uh, it, it stopped working for us, and at that point we decided to migrate to using Red Hat Satellite and we lost the direct Ansible integration. We considered, we didn't spend too much time evaluating the best possible replacement, so we are just using uh, what is calling Ansible core on the command line, mainly after the satellite prisoning phase completes. And, you know, we, we, we pipe its output to a, like a, you know, redirect it output to a log file. And uh, we also often run Ansible against like, you know, six systems overnight, because we have night shift uh, technicians doing many of these upgrades. So when you say manually, like a human, yeah, human runs Ansible against each, you know, against uh, an, 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 an Ansible uh, host inventory file. You know, they, they inter you know, before machines get joined to the domain, you know, they don't, we just use a local admin account. After they're joined, we could use our own accounts with our proprietary version of sudo. But you authenticate with those credentials. There's many better ways of doing it, but in the interest of speeding up provisioning time for uh, technicians and for users, we focused on these improvements as opposed to better automatically calling Ansible after provision. I, I would honestly like to use Ansible pull mode, to be honest. So actually, that's exactly what I was going yes. to say. Yes, yeah. I think I'm the only person in the world using Ansible pull mode, but so what we have is um, our Kickstart sets up a uh, system D that starts up on boot. So once it reboots after it's installed, it does Ansible pull and runs Ansible for the Right. And that's worked great. And then you don't have to remember to manually do anything. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, we don't have Linux laptops yet, and I'm wondering if we enter a pull mode, how could we collect the logs, particularly for monthly patching slash configuration updates? So yeah. I'm, I'm going to look into whether Ansible Tower or the free Ansible WX, you know, the upstream project for Tower uh, can do that, uh, like collect logs over the internet from clients in pull mode. Can yes. You compare the speed of um, adding all these packages into a Kickstart. So and just maintaining with Ansible. Backend. So I, you know, I, I that is we didn't we looked into you know. So I'd like to I prefer to have the entire as much of the configuration as possible to find the Ansible rather than be a Kickstart, because I'd like to have you know the this package needs to be installed. I'd like to define that in one place, not in multiple places, and. We actually do import a gigantic package list from a TXT file. Uh, it's like called Ansible, Ansible, like, it's like, I forget, I forget what it's called. There's a function, there's a way of Ansible importing like a variables from another data source. And this is one line per file. Um, um, I'm, trying to, I'm drawing a mental blank on it, but, um, that would be another way of solving the problem, but we'd still need to use no sync on the uh, uh, Kickstart in, in the the what's it called the like the 300 megabyte image that Kickstart runs on top of. We need to put no sync on top of that to achieve as much speed as this. Um, there are ways of trying to integrate uh, you know Kickstart into that Anaconda you know 300 uh, image, but uh, it's we thought this would be more maintainable.
Oh, another thing too is we often, you know, we also want to like when I, often when we install certain packages, we immediately do things afterwards, like oh, set you know disable this one thing that's put by policy or add replace some of their files with symlinks, you know. So we'd like to have oh, packages installed and define their uh, their their configuration all in Ansible. We're trying to use like a role for every application we both install from via package and then configure afterwards. Well, thank you very much to our two volunteers who have brought us back onto schedule here. Mm-hmm.